Hello everybody, this is James the Bowen, the Scovenant, dedicated to original peoples as always. And we've got a special guest in today from Brazil, Amilica Pereira. Hope I said that right. How are you doing, my brother? You okay? Good, good, thank you. Well, it sounds very good. You you know how to say my name. You Excellent. you sound like a Brazilian person saying my name. It's very difficult to to find someone capable to do this here in UK. Yeah, well, I, I was out, out there about maybe 12, was it 12, 2010, Rio de Janeiro. Very great place. Um, blended it's my in, city. Blended in easy. Yeah, I'm there. from Rio. Yeah. So what's your background that you know of? Um, I'm assuming like African descent and Portuguese or something, maybe native, the indigenous, maybe a mixture of all, from what you know. Oh, I, I'm a... I use it to I I uh I always say that I'm a son of the anti-racist struggle in Brazil. Uh, my father is a black leader, one of the leaders of the black movement in Brazil since the 1970s, and my mother is a white woman. Uh, a very she came from a very poor family in Minas Gerais, a state, uh, a different state of the state where I was born. I was born in Rio de Janeiro. And my father and my mother met in Rio when she was working as a maid. She used to work in, uh, in, a, in a house, in a rich housing in Rio. And they they knew each other and they, they got married. And I mix it, uh, yeah. but I grew up in my father's family, which is a black family in Rio. So I see myself as a black man yeah. with light skin. And uh, I took part in the anti-racist struggle since I, I was born, because I was with my father in all manifestations, in all the events uh, they were, they were uh, participating my mother and my father since I was born. So I see myself as one of the sons of the anti-racist struggle in Brazil. Excellent, definitely. Well, in places like we're from UK, even though we are mixed origin, we just say the same. We just call ourselves black people. Um, well, on my father's side, we know in Africa where we're from, Nigeria, and on my mom's side, we know we have Trinidad and we have European blood in us as well. Well, I've always just gravitated to the African ancestry more so because I know that's the original place that we come from. And it's also being nurtured from a child. I was taught about Africa a lot uh, by my father. Then I decided as I got older to take it a lot further rather than just understand just where you're from, and just basic culture. I started getting into true history of all of Africa, you know, and studying a lot of indigenous uh, peoples around the planet. I travel a lot, you know, I travel many places in the world, all continents to visit indigenous peoples and learn the history. Now, in Brazil now, and not just also Brazil, also you can, other Latin American countries, let's say, race is a funny finger fat. Even when I was in Venezuela, Cuba, some places, Dominican Republic, I find like that, so, do you have like is is it almost like categories of like they use where like mestizo or for example uh, mulatto and then also the will say black and then the will say white. Now when they say for example white, sometimes like see like the Portuguese for example, people might consider them as white, but some of them are not actually full white. Some of them could be mixed with, uh, you had the Moors from, you know, Morocco, Mauritania, that went into there from North Africa. So ca race category is quite a funny thing. And it's great when we can just decide ourselves as individuals who we are. And that's why I like your approach of no matter how they categorize, I know like you can give me some insight of your own in Brazil. How do they categorize race? Do they go by complexion? Or what? How do you define race? Like different races in Brazil, because the people all sort of shades as well. Yeah. We are mixed nation. I yeah. have to say that. Uh, but we, as a 
as a, a country, we receive it the, through the slavery trade. We receive it uh, the the biggest uh, amount of enslaved people in Africa in during the three hundred uh, years of of slavery. So the modern slavery system. So we receive it in Brazil uh, about five million enslaved people brought from Africa to Brazil. It's a lot of people. And so uh, when you see the Brazilian population, it is the second biggest population of African descent in the whole world. We have nowadays uh, understand, identifying their, themselves as, as black people, about 56% of the Brazilian population, which means more than 110 million people. So it's a, a huge uh, amount of many of uh, black people in Brazil. But uh, the people who see themselves as, as black people, they are in general mixed too. But the the you said the phenotype, the appearance, how the complexion you you said. Uh, it's something really important in Brazil to define who is black and who is not. But it depends on the context, depend, de depends on the power relations and where you are in Brazil, because Brazil is a huge country. It's more than 20, two, 220 million people. It's a huge, it's very big. It's almost as big as U.S. So it's like a continent. Inside. It's the biggest country in South America. If you go to Bahia, where about 80% of the, the population see themselves as, as black, uh, someone like me can be white in Bahia. We have these expressions. It's white from Bahia. <laughs> white from Bahia means that you are not very, very white in your complexion. But you can be white in Bahia because 80% of the population are black. But if you go to the south, and I, I I gave many lectures, I went to the south of Brazil many times, and the south in Brazil, especially Santa Catarina and Rio Grande do Sul, are white states, majority white states. So there, I'm not white. Obviously, they see me as a mixed person. Depend on I wear, uh, because sometimes, uh, and I, I felt that uh, some 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 policeman uh, was following me in some situations because they see me as a non-white person. So Brazil is huge, and it depends where you are, the history and the context, the social context, the the power relations, because. Um, in parts of Rio Grande do Sul, uh, in general, at the universities, um, I can I can be seen as a white man. But if I go to the uh, place of power, people don't see me as a white because I'm not as white as the Italian and the German who migrated to there and stayed kind of uh, in their own communities. So, uh, but. Uh, I think this is this is important to know the complexion of the person. It's really important to the way you 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 are seen by the population, but it depends on the context. So in my I, I grew up in a favela, in a very poor community, very poor community, the majority overwhelmingly majority black people in that community. So there. I would be seen as a white man. But in place of power in Rio, uh, I'm not seen by the other people as a white man. So it depends even in the same city. But wow. uh, it, it is important, the complexion to, to define, not the like in US. There, there's no, the. it's not possible to have a one drop role in Brazil because yeah. everybody has at least one drop, one drop of, other uh, yeah. descendants, because we are definitely a mixed society. But racism is historically structuring the relations among people in Brazil. So uh, 
if you look more if you look more wide you have much more chances in general to be successful in your work or even in schools i i study education and i can tell you this is something important um you when you think about race relations in brazil to understand uh how not only in curricula but in the practices in the day to day life how race relations affect the possibilities of the black students in brazil uh i think this is it it depends on the context but uh, the complexion is really important well, what's interesting is, is when you mention different parts of brazil how they view race i mean i wasn't actually i didn't actually look into it like that um now you also mentioned about some italians germans being there now is this the the time um and I don't know if it was the 60s, you, you know the date better than me, when they brought over many European people. The, the many Europeans that were brought over, not as slaves, just as migrants to go there. And um, from from what I was looking at is they were seeing Brazil as too, too predominantly black. So they wanted to whiten it up by bringing several European people coming over. I don't know if that was around the 60s or... You'd know the, the uh, much before much before how much before what actually what uh, let let me give you some historical context on Please, the yeah. race relations in brazil yeah. so brazil received about 5 million of enslaved people during the slavery uh, atlantic trade yeah. so the modern slavery um, made it possible uh, for the colonizers to to bring uh about 5 million people. So when you go to the 19th century, the majority of the population is made by uh, by black people. Definitely, yeah. Uh, not only enslaved people, because during the process, many black people achieved freedom, different ways. So we have a experience in Brazil uh, of black freedom during the slavery season. It's important to say, because uh the the idea of race is a construction and the modern idea of race uh, established in brazil as something uh, that would really limit the, the 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 possibilities of development of the the black person in the 19th century but so when you go to the the, the 19th century the majority of the population is made up of black people so the Brazilian governments uh, trying to to become a modern society uh, after the abolition of slavery, Brazil was a well. Brazil was colonized by Portuguese, so by Portugal, and in 1822 we became an independent empire, the Empire of Brazil, and uh, linked to Portugal, Portugal, but independent politically at least theoretically <laughs> independent. In 1888, with the abolition of slavery, which was the, the last abolition in the whole hemisphere, it was something really terrible. Uh, 20 years, uh, more than 20 years after the abolition in US, for example. So in 1889, we became a republic. After the end of the slavery, we become we became a republic. And this republic, uh, historically, the leaders and the, the, the power established in Brazil were trying to modernize, to, to make Brazil a modern society. And they understood that Brazil should be white. So they started, uh, actually, they, they invested much more than the empire in the process of whitening the nation. So this is why... Uh, only between 1890s and, and 1930s, about 40 years, a, a little bit more than 40, 40 years in, in the early 20th century in Brazil, we received about 4 million Europeans wow. as migrants in Brazil. Wow. And almost half part of these 4 million uh, Europeans who arrived in Brazil, about, about 2 million came subsidized by the Brazilian government, which means that the biggest public policy uh, in the first republic, in the beginning of a republic in Brazil, 
was the migration, was to subsidize the migra migrations of Europeans to modernize, to make Brazil uh, a kind of white country. So uh, it, it is something really important to understand race relations in Brazil because uh, the whole educational system created in the Republic was Eurocentric. Because when you they, say modernize, they, they, it's funny when you yes, say they were trying to yeah. they were trying to whiten in the nation not only in the complexion but also culturally. Yeah. So the whole educational system is was thought in that moment as a kind of a hospital, a hospital to whitening culturally the Brazilian population. So this this has a profound a profound mark in the formation, the historical formation of Brazilian society. This is why I can say that racism is structuring the relations between or among people in Brazilian society. When, when the Europeans see modernization, they don't see it as a movement forward in a positive light. It's modernization to them is more racism. <laughs> you know, it's the, the very backward thinking it's a very backward way of thinking, but this is how they take control wherever they go in the world. It doesn't matter if they go to the United States, Australia, anywhere in the world, South Africa, the same system, the same mentality, you know, um, it's almost like Nazism to a degree, you know, if you want to look at it that way. But at the same time, it's um, it's interesting how the whole beginning of this anyway with, um, so when the Portuguese have brought in, brought Africans over and enslaved them into Brazil. What year, because this is very early, the reason why I've mentioned the Portuguese, because they, they were the first to transport Africans into slavery out of the Europeans. So with the Portuguese, with the, what data are we dealing with when they first brought Africans to Brazil? From Africa. Can you repeat, please? Yeah, the, I was saying question. that... With the Portuguese being very early slave traders from the Europeans, mm. what was the year that they brought Africans to Brazil? In the beginning, it was yeah. in the 1535, 1536. Very early. After, yeah, they arrived in, in Brazil in 1500. And what part of Africa and were they from? Uh, I, I, I'm i not a specialist on in slavery trade, but I would say in the region where today is Angola, Cape Verde, it's the western uh, coast of, of Africa, because the people from the east coast of Africa came more in the 18th and the 19th century. So in the early process of, of slavery, I would say the people came from the region uh, where is Angola in the Western? I was only asking that because of the linguistics. Some of them still speak an African language. Some of them. Now, is the Yoruba speakers in Brazil? In Bahia, many people can speak Yoruba. Interesting. But, but it's, not, it's not spread in Brazilian society. We have a lot of, uh, I always say that, uh, we have a very famous uh, leader of the black movement in the 1990s, uh, Lelia Gonzalez. She was an intellectual, a scholar. She was a professor in Rio. And she uh, used it to say that we, this, the very language we speak in Brazil is not Portuguese. It should be called Portuguese. It's like black, black geese because of the importance of the... African language in the very language we speak in Brazil. So uh, if you go to Portugal and you listen to the people speaking in Portugal, you probably will think it's another language. When you go to Rio or Bahia to listen to people speaking the Portuguese of Brazil, it's really different. It not only, it's not different only how it sounds, it sounds very differently, but we use other different words because we represent the we represent the world with through language based on the experience we have in this world. And the experience of being a Portuguese people is very different 
of yeah. this experience of being a Brazilian. As I told you, 5 million enslaved people brought to Brazil, 350 years of slavery, and the genocide of the indigenous people in Brazil. So the experience of being Brazilian is very dif different historically from the experience of being a Portuguese person. So the, the, the very language we speak is, is very different. And we use different words uh, comparing to the Portuguese in Brazil. It's not the same like uh, the English from US and UK. You, you see different sounds different, but you, in general, use the same structure and the same words to, to explain the world. Now, when I mentioned uh, about Yoruba speakers, because even though Yoruba is in Nigeria, and um, like you said, a lot of people from Angola and other parts of West Africa. Now, Yoruba at one time was quite widely spoken, even outside of Nigeria, you know, due to the Yoruba Empire. So that's why it was interesting, because um, even like places like Trinidad, where my mother's side is from, there's parts there where they were taken from Nigeria and Guinea, and some Yoruba speakers, Cuba, I'm sure there's some Yoruba speakers in Cuba, and also with Haiti, Haiti, most definitely. So it's interesting in um, keeping the language. That's what I thought was very interesting um, as much as like people try to destroy the language, destroy the names, um, the whole heritage, the culture, but to keep the culture intact. Now, this would only be, I'm assuming, in certain parts of Brazil, I'm assuming. Um, what parts would you say of Brazil where they, the African cul culture the heritage is quite still intact. Would you say it's more down the south, or is it in various parts of? It's in the northeast. Oh, it's actually the northeast, uh, right? Yeah, many people from Africa goes to Salvador of Bahia. It's the capital of the state of Bahia to listen people listen to people speaking Yoruba. Wow! And many people come to São Luís do Maranhão. It's the capital of the state of Maranhão. To, to see the Mina culture, the, because we, we have uh, some uh, religious tradition uh, from, which came from Africa, and it, it remained uh, in being uh, important to the population, especially in São Luís do Maranhão, the Tambor de Mina, the, the the religious uh, linked to the regions of we uh, the the mine coast from Africa and the same with the Yoruba tradition in in Bahia so I would say where you can find that uh, African presence especially through religion and culture would be São Luís do Maranhão e Salvador da Bahia. Right, it's interesting. And such it's a, such a huge population. People do forget that outside of Africa, Brazil has the largest African population around the world. I think that was so amazing that which we don't really hear too much on um like even like Colombia, for example, is a lot of African heritage and all that, but it's like almost from I don't know exactly how it is in the country that you're living in, but from outside we get the Western perspective of they basically put they they basically cut the numbers down on how many black people are in Colombia or in Brazil or certain other Latin American countries. But it's very important to do our own research. And for me, it's about trying to engage with people of those countries who are professors like yourself or or just have a great detail of knowledge on the history. Because we get a, we we get fed Western perspectives of things, and that's why I love to travel and meet different people and learn and speak to the people myself. So when it comes to um, some of the indigenous peoples there, and um, you know we have the Amazon rainforest. You know this is a such an amazing place that's still there. And so do they mix? Do the, would you say the indigenous people do they mix with some of the Africans, or would you say they live separate? Do, or do even Africans live in the Amazon? We have 
a lot of black people living in Amazon. Actually, I met two of them in yeah. Essex, Essex yesterday. I went to the University of Essex to give a lecture, and I met two black Brazilians from Manaus, from the north of the of of Brazil, and from the the biggest city in the for the rainforest there in Amazon. We have, but the indigenous population uh, were killed in in numbers that sounds not just unacceptable, but uh, unbelievable because we used to have more indigenous people in Brazil when the Portuguese arrived here in the, in, five, in 1500 than we have nowadays, which is something just crazy. So the genocide of the indigenous people in Brazil is something real. And, and but... W- w- just just some numbers for you to to have the context so the the black population the people who identify themselves as blacks as african descent people from african descent in brazil we are 56% of the population the indigenous people are less than 1% so it's wow. about 0.8% of the brazilian population after affirmative action because it was about 0.4 10 years ago, and the numbers increase it. Uh, there are more people identifying themselves as, as indigenous people, but it's not 1% of the, the Brazilian population. And they are not only in the rainforest. They are not only in, in Amazon. They are spread through the Brazilian country. So uh, I met uh, uh, some indigenous people living in Rio de Janeiro. And I did also they, myself. They live in, yeah, I met yeah, some myself. And they yeah. live in yeah. they live in, in cities. They live they, they use computer, they have cell phones, they go to the university, and so the, the, this image of the indigenous living in the forest, like in the 1500th century. It's not something real. We have some communities, uh including we have in Brazil, which is something really difficult to find in any other part of the world. We have some isolated communities. They don't they don't have contacts to other people, not even with other indigenous people. They run and they live in the in the forest. We have this kind of community. They are very few. But the majority of the indigenous people uh, in Brazil are spread through the the territory of the country uh, but I, I certainly the biggest part is in in the region not only uh, in in Amazonia because Amazonia is one of the Brazilian states but the Amazon region Pará uh, Tocantins uh, even in, uh, in the south of this part of Brazil in Mato Grosso we can find uh, a lot of indigenous people trying to survive in fighting colonialism until today. Wow. Well, an interesting thing I was looking at one time is I'm always researching about indigenous peoples. Now, when I was looking at Brazil, I'm sure you might have came across this yourself. Um, they were reconstructing the oldest um, skeletal remains in Brazil. And it was the when they reconstructed, they seen it was a black lady. They called it Lucia named after Lucy in Africa, with it being the oldest. Now, very interesting to wonder, like, well, the first people, like, and these skeletal remains maybe about 13,000, 12,000 years ago, something like that. Uh, but there would be similar skeletal remains on the coast. I think it was more like the Amazon area and also around the Pacific coast, the California coast, similarities. So it's interesting to wonder what happened to these black people, the first black people that were in Brazil. Now, obviously, at one time when people first migrated from Africa, people stayed black for a certain period of time. And also, what they tried to do is, though, they more connected Lucia to something similar in the Pacific. So you had the people in Papua New Guinea, the Melanesian type, Aboriginal Australian. They were more connected Lucia to the Pacific people and Australasian people. Now, 
I don't know exactly how factual that is. I mean, yeah, we know they were seafarers, the Pacific Islanders, but at the same time, Africans were also seafarers. You know, there's many times that Africans, even you have the Olmecs, um, I don't know if you're aware of them, the, in, in Mexico, the big giant colossal heads, where the Africoid features. Um, so these are like 1500 BC, 1600 BC, different times. So there seems like there's definitely different periods of time where black Africans have came into these lands, South, South America, North America, Mexico areas. So it's very interesting, like, I mean, but obviously all up the years have gone, different migrations have came in to Brazil, you know, um, also all of the Americas from the Beard and Land Bridge one time, the Mongoloid type, uh, they call them, Inuit, Eskimo, all them types. But um, do you think that when when are you and is there any reference to when the Portuguese first came to Brazil, did they encounter any black people already here that you're aware There's of? No, no. Only only I've, reason why I've, I asked I've that. never I've never heard. Only reason, I know this story. Yeah, only reason why I asked that was because Christopher Columbus, when he came to America, the people he described were already here. Some of them were copper colored people that we described. So that's why I was wondering um, if there was any reference that you've came across like that. Interesting. No, I've never had any reference like this. I, think maybe... I, I know some some people who 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 tells the story by by other uh like like you were saying before, but I've never seen and uh, an evidence or or a report uh, mm -hmm. about this uh, when the Portuguese arrived in the 16th century. Right, no problem. But definitely with Lucia, that's going back to 12,000 years where the that was like a factual thing where the but that's the whole planet at one time was black people anyway, first leaving Africa. That's the question. And That's then, the question. The civilization, the Homo sapiens, they 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 grew in 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 Africa. So That's the, the 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 possibilities uh, of migration started there in Africa. So yeah, then environmental this, change can happen. In this it, sense, we are all descendants of of Africans. Definitely, all the human beings. Definitely. So, what well, what was your plans when you came to? So you came over to um, Cambridge from Brazil, and you've been doing a lot of you've been doing some studies while you came to Liverpool also, and you've met a few different people. I was sorry I couldn't make it myself, um, but how how did you find the the UK as far as in your studies? It's interesting. Uh, I, I'm enjoying and I'm glad. Actually, I was kind of invited for from uh, a professor of the University of Cambridge. We uh, she invited me to to send a project to compete in a public call from the British Acad Acad Academy. And I won this uh, visiting fellowship from the British Academy. And I, I studied the black movement. I, I've been doing research on the black movement, especially in Brazil, but also in the US for the last 20 years. And as I said before, my father is one of the black leaders of the black movement in Brazil. So I, I, I'm interested in the history of the black movement since I, I understand myself as a human being. So, uh, and and I don't I didn't know anything about the black movement here in UK, and so when the professor Catherine Miller, which is a very nice person, invited me to this possibility of of being a visiting professor here in Cambridge, I thought, well, I should know more about the black movement, about the black power movement, about about the race relations in UK. So I'm trying to understand better, and I, I'm my plan is to write a book on uh, on this black movement in a transnational transnational perspective. I know well the black movement in Brazil. I can say that I've been studying for more than twenty years, and I know some of the black movement in in 
about some history of the black movement in US and I'm learning a lot about the the black movement here in UK and I hope I, I will have the opportunity to to travel more and to see and to learn about the the black movements in different parts of the diaspora yes yeah, so that's interesting your book that's going to be coming out anyway and one thing that's great, um, you coming into not just the UK, coming into Liverpool and to be a, a guest on my show, Original Peoples, which is definitely a very important show for you to be on, because it's one thing that we fight against racism, but it's another thing to connect to the real core of pro-blackness, Africanness, original peopleness. And I'm a person who's got Wherever the black people are in the world, I'm right there, you know. So I'm interested to hear everybody's stories because we all have a common course all around this planet. And it's very important that uh, that you came on my show. And very important that I was able to connect to you, which I'm a global person. Your mind is not like small, in, in, centered in a city, in a country. I understand that people are global people. I'm going through the same kind of struggles with every are in this world, which I've witnessed myself. So it's definitely a privilege for me to have you on the show. And um, you would explain before about your book. If you want to um, give us some details on your book that will be coming out, that will be great. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm still writing, but uh, the plan is to think about the the black movement in a transnational perspective focusing the action of the black movement around the 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 area of education so yeah. uh, i coordinate a group in in my university in the federal university of uh, rio de janeiro uh, the group dedicated to the un, un, anti racist education so we are trying to understand how this anti-racist education is produced by the black movement all around the world uh, in a transnational perspective. This is what I'm writing about. And I hope it's going to be finished next year. Excellent. It sounds great anyway, you know, and it's great for us to be able to connect, even though some of us have different languages, you know, some people are speaking Portuguese, some are speaking Spanish, English, French, and then some just speak African. Aruba. Aruba, yeah. So <laughs> it's it's interesting how we're able to connect. I mean, great with Professor Smalls, he's able to speak Portuguese, Spanish as well, you know. So, and yourself, your English is very clear, you know. Um, where did you first learn English? It's very clear. Oh. Thank, thank you. Uh, I, I, I grew up in a very poor family. As I told you, my, my father was a black militant. I always studied, studied all my life in public schools. I've never had, when I was a young man, the opportunity of studying English. So I started learning English when I went to the university in Brazil. And I, when I was a PhD, I got the one grant from the Brazilian government to go to the U.S. to do research there in the U.S. on the black movements there. Uh, I was in my second year as, as a PhD, and I arrived in the U.S. without understanding anything people were saying. Yeah. I always told the story because I arrived in the airport of Atlanta, and it's a huge airport. And the, when I arrived, they needed to take... Uh, to, to take another flight from from Atlanta to Baltimore, so I, I I thought I would leave that terminal and go walking to the other terminal where I should take the the another the other flight, but the person there was saying you have to take a train and I couldn't understand to take a train it it it, it makes no sense I'm in in the, in the airport because I would never yeah. think about this because in Brazil the airports are small comparing to the airports in US or here in in UK so my english was really bad i could read because i studied by myself so i could read english but i could not understand what people were saying so i i had to learn there living in US and from there to now i've been 
returning to the U.S., I made a lot of friends there. So Stephen Small, a professor, he's a, he's a great friend. So I went to his university some years ago. So I'm, I'm always going to the U.S. and my, my English improved. I've, I've been improving my English through this contact, talking to people, reading, but I've never had the opportunity to to study English as it it should be uh, done by by in my point of view. Everybody in Brazil or other parts, we we should have the opportunity to learn other languages because it opens our possibilities in as you said in this global community. So, but thank you. <laughs> no, definitely, it's very clear. You know, I wasn't too sure um, if you might have, before you came on the show, I wasn't too sure how great your English would be. But at the same time, I mean, everyone is always trying to believe people should speak English, but I think we people should be able to speak multiple languages. I think that's a, that's more of a fair way of putting it. Now, when, when you, because you know, because now that you're trying to travel, so you've seen in Brazil, I'm going to ask you first what about Brazil, then I'll ask you your experience in the United States and also your experience in the UK, dealing with black people, basically. So in Brazil, from what you, majority of people that you've came across growing up um, or even people that you've studied about, what would you say um, the average Brazilian knows about himself or herself to basically, do they know much about the African roots or is there some people that don't understand the roots as much or through education? How would you describe it on on a large scale? Even though, we, like, like you were saying, there's people who still speak African languages, they still preserve the culture, but that's only some part you were saying. So on a whole, from what your experience is, would you say many of them are have a good, good idea of where they're from and the culture? No, no, no. It's uh, as I told you, the educational system in Brazil was Eurocentric since the beginning. It was created to widen in the nation culturally. So, in my university, for example, which is the biggest uh, federal university in Brazil, and the public universities are the best universities in Brazil, are the more prestigious universities in Brazil. So my university is the first university in Brazil and the biggest federal. It's one of the most prestigious universities in Brazil. And the only in I, I, I teach to I form history teachers. So I'm a historian. I work with the history education. And my students didn't have the opportunity to have a course on history of Africa a mandatory course in my university until 2019. Wow. So four years ago, it we we were successful in changing a little bit the curricula of the history course in my university. So you see, we we never had the opportunity to study the the histories of Africa and the experience of the African people here in Brazil uh, until very recently. So the truth is we are discovering, we are investing in doing research on history of Africa and history of Afro-Brazilians uh, for unfortunately about 30 to 20 years now. So in general, the population of Brazil don't know much about the histories of Africa and their roots in in Africa, but it's something that has been changing. Uh, well, I must say, we have a, a federal law since two thousand and three. It's twenty years ago. Uh, a federal law that made it mandatory the teaching of African and Afro-Brazilian histories in all schools. Great. This is something that uh, started a process of making it possible to the Brazilian society in general to know more about the roots in Africa, about the experience of the black population here or there in Brazil. So it's something that has been changing the last 20, 20 years to 30 years. Well, that's great that, you know, it's very important that people are getting this education to know about the roots 
And it's one thing to know about what happened during the slave trade and where you came from in Africa, but it's another thing to know some of the great things Africans did throughout history. The greatest civilizations, you know, many different parts of Africa, empires, rich civilizations as well. Sometimes people, the keepers stuck on, well, I found this where I'm born anyway, is the focus, a lot of focuses on the slave trade, where sometimes it's no room to look at who Africans were. We deal with a lot of like who we became rather than who we, who we was. And from, like from my own history myself of Nigeria, I'm aware of like they had the knock culture, you know, the Iron Age you had, you know, um, farmers, you know, there's a lot of different rich civilizations that we had. And it's I think it's important to oh, try God. to have a balance a bit of a balance on different things. Whatever, I mean, don't get me wrong, whatever your line of research is, that's what you do. But it's important to know that we weren't just only slaves. We had great civilizations before anyone on this planet. And we Africans influence a lot of other peoples in different parts of the world to give them civilization. So it wasn't until, until I really started getting deeper to the studies from when I was younger, I just knew that we are Nigerian descent, a Numi tribe, the geographical area where we're from. But it was not until I started deeply researching myself of what our people did that was great in different parts of Africa. You know, Ghana, the Songhai Empire, Mansa Musa in Mali, the richest man ever, Timbuktu, Great Zimbabwe, even like them Nile Valley civilizations, they were black civilizations. So... It's very interesting to know about um, all these great civilizations. And um, as of course, we've got to know about the enslaved times as well. So it's taking the bad with the good. That's what I believe it is. And and it's great that he's made that leap, that step in Brazil to start teaching African studies. Now, is there any African studies in Brazil where they teach about African empires or African civilizations? Or are they just slowly catching up and only dealing with uh, the transatlantic slave trade? Do they deal with anything pre-slavery about um, in Africa the roots? For sure. In in my universe now we have one mandatory course on history of Africa, and it's it starts before the colonization, before the the, the contact with Europeans. So. Uh, in many other universities all around Brazil, they are studying more about the history of Africa since 2003, especially because of the, the law that made it mandatory the teaching of African and Afro-Brazilian histories in all schools. It didn't affect directly the universities, but the history teachers didn't know anything about Africa. So the universe had to to change the curricula in order to be able to form new teachers capable of discussing something about the history of Africa. So uh, it, uh, we need a lot, a lot more investment to make it possible for all the history teachers to know more about the histories of Africa, especially this history before the Europeans arrived, arriving there in the for 15th century. But uh, we are getting better in this way. And I, I'm not uh, optimistic, but I see the process. And I understand that this process of knowing more about Africa, about the history of Africa, and have more knowledge produced in Brazil on the experience of, of being an Afro-Brazilian, this is a process that won't stop. We are going ahead and we will keep going on this process in Brazilian society for the next years, in That's my great. point of view. That's great because we need something that gives us a higher self-esteem, you know, and build our confidence, not just like we were only slaves, because when we only know about the slave trade, that's when they can say things like you had no civilization, you were savages, cannibals, and but at the same time, the invaders were more behaving like savages and cannibals, <laughs> you know. So it's it's because one thing I, it is um, a real I really feel for people who ha are a little behind with the history in certain different countries of African descent, 
So it's great that we're able to connect on a global continental level, like us speaking now, you know, on Zoom internet, having access to the internet to be able to search various different sites. And it, I think it's a great, great time within now to be able to research. And there's even there's research that comes out new every day. That's what's so great about it. I'm digging every single day. There's not one day I do, do not deal with African research or the indigenous people's research because even some people think I might do it too much, but I understand this is a war. <laughs> it's a it's a spiritual war, it's a cultural war, it's 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 very it's very deep. So I don't have time to take a break off it because every day I feel like the Europeans are breathing down our necks in some sort of way, whether it's educational, spiritually culturally, economically, many different ways that it's like they've got the foot on our necks. So that's why I'm very serious with it. And I'll travel anywhere around the planet to find out research, visit any temple I need to visit, go to any museum that is necessary and go to any rainforest or any indigenous secluded areas, which I've done many secluded areas in throughout Asia, the Pacific, every many places, and, you know, it's a sacrifice to do these things at times when I was even in Southeast Asia. And people are not aware of the black people, the original peoples in some of these rainforests and these mountainous areas like the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand. People didn't even know. So I went into these places. Some of them are seven hour drives, eight hour drives. It didn't matter to me. All that was mattered is to complete my mission to get there, engage with these peoples speak to these people, learn about did you have a God, you know, learn all these different things. Um, what I find is um, a lot of people around the planet had a supreme being that they worshipped, and it's very, very similar, where even though people speak of the multiple gods, they all were aware that there was one deal with one aim, um, one creation, which I thought was very interesting. So it's the digger the deep I found, the blacker it gets, wherever you go in the world. So even you could go into South of China, those skeletal remains there, even only a few thousand years ago, will be predominantly Negroid or Oceanic type. So it's very interesting that the diggy, the more you dig, the blacker it gets. So now in um, Brazil, we get back to there anyway. When the Europeans, um, the influx of the large migration you're talking about that happened in the late 1800s to up to about 1930s you were saying around about them times did this bring a whole lot of racism when they came in would you say from how it was because actually it the the, the public policy that made it possible to bring all these Europeans in the early 20th century were informed by eugenics, by racism. Yeah. So uh, it, 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 it is important to understand how the, the Brazilian state invested in this uh, racial policy in Brazil to in order to whiten the nation. So it, it increases the, the, the racism, which was already there, because racism is linked to colonialism. So colonialism is what made it possible, the creation of the slavery trade, and it, it was what made it possible, the creation of the modern racism in, in our different societies. So this, this process of... Uh, trying to widen in the nation was completely informed by racism. So it increases the and made it much more difficult to the black population and to indigenous population in Brazil during the 20th century. So a lot of the hierarchy in Brazil, would they be the white people or like, well, near enough white um, who, who were the ruling elite in Brazil? You get the best so white, Yeah. No, we we deal with the white supremacy here in U.S. in Brazil because of colonialism, the Western European colonialism in Asia, in Africa, in in the Americas. So we have to deal with this this racism, which is transnational. Mm. So the word independence, we should rethink about what these words mean, because. 
it, it, wherever we are in the Caribbean and Africa, like I don't take that word independence lightly, because if you're not in control of your own country, then there's a problem. Even though people celebrate Independence Day, Jamaica Independence Day, African countries celebrate Independence Day, but they're still dealing with a colonial mind, a colonial power. So I think we have to rethink on what independence really is and maybe consider reopening that discussion on a wider field to deal with true independence. How do you feel about that? I'm with uh, Bob Marley when he says, emancipate yourself from mental slavery. Definitely. I, definitely. I agree with him. Take the chains off the brains, you know, because that's what it is. Even though people might be free from the shackles, the chains are still on the mind. And this is where it's so important to dig deep into the ancestors and know what your ancestors represented, what they fought for. You know, um, this is a long, long struggle, a long battle. And we're still, people sometimes believe they're free because they might be in a great position or some people, they become millionaires or the, you know, the life changes. But then they realize as they're going up the ladder, as a black person, you know, only so far you're going to go. It's, you know, and also it's about playing the game, what most people do, you know, this is why I like I do my media very independent and I can't have anything sabotage my movements. Also, you can get some some of our own people who are still have a colonial mind. And some people say to me, Oh, why don't I concentrate on other things? And I'm saying, no, this is the way I am. Even before I was doing any kind of podcast interviews, I've always been pro-black, pro-African, you know, high self-esteem and recognizing who who we are, not just who we became. So I will continue this and I hope to meet and interview many of our people wherever we are on this planet. The mission still continues. And it's been great speaking to you today anyway, and I've learned a lot from you. Learning from the inside, which is so important, rather than just read books and just speak to people from a Western perspective. So if you could give us a little, um, what's your future plans anyway? Um, you plan to travel a bit more, you was mentioning. And also, what was your experience in the USA? Meeting black people there. That was, that's interesting to know. Yes, I the, the two opportunities I had in the US, uh, I went to work with black professors there. First with Professor Michael Hanchard. Yeah which is a very important uh, black scholar there in the U.S., and then with Professor David Scott in Columbia University in, in New York. So uh, my my base is in U.S. My, my, my relations are, in general, with the black community at the university in the U.S. And uh, I, I, I've been learning a lot here in the U.K., and my plans... Uh, to the future to think about these uh, differences and the similarities on the struggle against racism made by black population in different parts of the world. I have now, uh, my, my wish is to spend some time in South Africa. And I learned here uh, with a colleague at the University of Cambridge about the work done by the Maori people in New Zealand. Interesting. And I got so impressed. I, I didn't know anything about how they are indigenizing the curriculum there in New Zealand. And I'm really curious to know more about the this struggle, this anti-racist struggle done by led by the Maori people in New Zealand through education. And and this is it. I, I will keep re writing my book. I hope next year I finish it. And I hope I have more opportunities to travel, especially in this moment. I'm thinking South Africa and then in New Zealand. I just got back from South Africa last November. Last November, I was there and then maybe I went to did some interviews with some South Africans. Now, you know, in South Africa, they have some people who they're in the category of calling themselves coloreds, and you have people who just consider that as black. 
So what I did is I interviewed someone who was considered as a colored and someone who was considered black. And it's very interesting because it's the same struggle, but but sometimes it there's almost like a divide. When I say divide, uh, the person who I was interviewing who considers himself as a colored, as I was speaking to my, we just say black in the UK, but he he's seen it as the the colors are at the bottom. That was from his, that was just his, his perspective. Uh, then I'd speak to someone who they consider as black. He's seen it as well going back during the times of um um I'd say before the before the apartheid even where the colors were categorized a little higher at certain time. But but I would look at it as I, I said to the same thing to the both. I said either way. The colonizer is going to make sure he's at the top. So whether or not you think you're second or third, you've got to look at who's above you. And I think once you remove the colonizer, I'm sure you'll get on just fine and be able to work out any differences and recognize we're just one people. That was my my view on the topic, rather than get into some engagements of separation, because the European has separated us very, very well. He's done a great job at, at separating us. But for me, it's about um, connecting to the common struggle and connecting as with one people. And hopefully South Africa can um, start like getting their history back. You know what I mean? I speak to some people in South Africa, some very educated people also. So it's not everybody. You know, it's, um, it's the very few people. And education is so important. And this is what we need to push for, more education. And if we can get this done, I believe that we can get things resolved a lot easier. So I, I hope you, so what you're planning in South Africa when you go there anyway, I'm, I'm interested to, to know what you'd be doing up there. Just uh, the, 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 the struggle against racism, racism uh, through education, how they have been building possibilities, strategies, and how they dialogue with what happens in different parts of the world, because I believe in this anti-racist education through a transnational perspective. So uh, this is the idea. Excellent, great. Well, traveling really broadens the mind, you know, so getting to see things firsthand and getting to these places is very important. And, you know, it just take, takes everything a lot further. And so when you were studying uh, to become a professor, how how many years did it take you to to get to this level? Well, few years. I I did my undergrad in history, and then I spent about two years in a master's degree in social sciences, and then more four years in the PhD. And during these four years of PhD, I I stayed one year in US as a PhD student there with Professor Michael Hancher, which helped me a lot. And so it's a long time, a long journey. And then I, I became a professor and I, I keep studying, I keep learning, I keep doing research all the time to learn more and to be able to talk with you and with everybody. As I told you, yesterday I was at the University of Essex here Next week, I'm going to to give a, a lecture uh, at the University of Cambridge. And so I have to study a lot. I have to keep being uh, a person, uh, investing in learning more, in studying more, to be able to be a good professor. Excellent. Now, um, I, I was unfortunate to not visit the Amazon rainforest when I was there. It was like... I didn't actually realize when I was in Rio how far it it, it actually is. So I was a little more really naive far. then. This is a long time ago. Have you been sometimes in the yourself? You can, yeah, sometimes you can buy a ticket, an uh, airplane ticket to Europe cheaper than uh, to go to Manaus or Pará, where you can see the Amazon Amazon forest. It's mm. very, very far, very distant. Brazil is a huge country, as I told you before. I've yeah, been yeah. in three different states of the Amazon forest. Wow. I've been in Pará many times. I, I I gave 
some courses, lectures there. I've been in Amapá, which is another state, and I've been in Acre, wow. another state, all in inside the, the Amazon forest. So I've learned I've learned uh, a lot with the the people there about the specificities about the the. the the strategies used by the indigenous people to fight racism in in that part of Brazil. But it's really different when you compare to the southeast of Brazil, where I am come from. I come from Rio, it's in the southeast part of Brazil. Wow, interesting. I mean, some very knowledgeable people like um, healers and, um, you know, very traditional knowledge that they have in these these kind of places. I've always encountered the indigenous peoples who are still living that lifestyle uh, to be quite quite intelligent as far as healing and, you know, special medicines and stuff. Now, interesting thing where you, you broke into favelas, you were saying. Now, first time I knew anything about the favelas, I'm sure you've seen it yourself. I watched a movie called The City of God. When I seen that movie, I was like, "Wow, I want to go to I want to go to Brazil." <laughs> that was like one of the first uh, things. I mean, that's what you think of that movie. Did you see, is it you see the truths to it? You know, what I mean, because a lot of violence with the youth, young people with the guns, and you know, it's like crazy in the favelas, like isn't it? It 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 was the director was a white man. But a lot of people who worked in the film were from favelas. Uh, yeah, yeah. So they brought their experience to the movie. But wow. the the narrative was uh, the narrative uh, created by a white man, which was not from the favelas. It's a good movie. I like the movie. Yeah. But it's different. Uh, for example, uh, in my experience, I see much more the good part of being a favela ah, right. then the director of the movie saw when he was creating this narrative for example we in the favelas we established community really community everybody uh, help each other because we are all poor people in need of a lot of things so we we create a community a sense of community which i i don't see in other parts of Rio where I live now, where where I I met uh, other people. So my experience growing up in a favela with this sense of community is is something that marked profound deeply my experience as a human being. And all the culture, all the samba, all the the music, all the dance we have in the favelas. This is something really important. I don't want to romanticize to th th this. It's really hard to grow up in a favela. I when I I became a professor, I moved it. I went to other parts of 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 Rio. Uh, I'm now in a more middle class zone of the city, yeah. and and I I I wanted to leave. I wanted to go to another place because I I was worried uh, because of the violence. I lost about fifty percent of my my friends. Wow! Uh, the majority black young men. They were murdered, uh, not only by the police, but because of the violence inside the community and uh, different groups in different communities. Uh, competing for prestigious and, and possibilities, including the, the traffic, the drug traffic. So I lost a lot of my friends wow. when I was growing up. So I'm a kind of a survival. So the violence is there. It's a, it's true. The violence is there. And it, 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 it is something terrible for the people who live there because 95% of the population has nothing to do to the crime or to the drugs or to everything. So people are workers, people are students, and people are trying to live and live better. But I don't see only the violence. I see also the culture. I see also the sense of community. I see also the, the friendship. 
Uh, and this is uh, very important to me. So uh, basically my graduate students, my PhD students and master's students are all from favelas. I always support uh, these students to to learn more and to, to get them out find the, possibilities yeah. of yeah. Uh, social mobility and, and, and have good jobs. So, well... Interesting, think, like you said, um, you're not trying to remote romanticize the movie. I mean, there were some great characters on it, like Little Dice, and he's called Little Z when he gets older. But what I found in that movie, there's still a sense of racism in it. I kept on seeing is, little different bits where he was, you know, the racist remarks being called, you know, in different parts of the movie. So would you say in the favelas is it more the um, is the is the divide or is it well, it's more of a sense of community from from when you were growing up rather than like racism in there like they try and make out in the movie there's different part different racism but obviously like you said it's written by a white man so he's gonna write it from his European Western Eye perspective. The book the book which is the base to the movie was written by a black man. But okay. the narrative in the movie the was by the director and the, yeah. the, the people who... You know, from racist, racist slayers in there all the time, you know, makes yeah. them feel better. But the book better. is better. Yeah. The book oh, written book. by Paulo Lins, he, he's a black man, a black writer. The book is better, in my point of view, than the, okay. the movie. I'll have to get the book because I want it from the true perspective, you know, so, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know if you can find it in, in, in English, but if you could read the book, you would agree with me. The book is better. Book. Uh, so I've got to get it into English translation. I've got to get, yeah, obviously I won't be able to read it otherwise. So, um, yeah, it's so, the same title. It's City of God. City of God, it's called. Okay. I'm going to look for this book in English version. But well, I've been, um, I really enjoyed today um, being a really great discussion and opening my mind. And it's good for you to connect with people like myself, you would on um, black consciousness on a global level. And um, I want to thank you very much anyway. Um, this is James DeBow on Discovering, dedicated to original peoples. And Amelika Pereira, I really appreciate your time. And if there's anything else you want to say just before we go, that'd be great. So thank you. Thank you very much, James. And you have a good day, and I hope I, I have contributed a little bit to the discussions. Excellent. Thank hopefully, you. hopefully we'll be in touch in the future. Oh, thank you.